From the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, this is Carolina Week. Good evening and thanks for joining us for the December 6th edition of Carolina Week. I'm Bridget Williams. And I'm Katie Parley. We're proud to be bringing you coverage of Carolina news and events. The Honor Code at UNC is a tradition of self-governance against lying, cheating, and stealing, a tradition as old as the school itself. Carolina Week's Bryce Framark tells us that sometimes a need for change comes with age. UNC Student Advisory Committee hosted an open forum Monday night to discuss improvements to the Honor Court system. Discussion included general concerns. We have in our library signs that say, uphold the proud tradition of the UNC Honor Code, right next to a sign that says, don't leave your backpack, thieves active in libraries. <laughs> Literally. To specific problems like the complicated manual on Honor Court policies. It's great that these are available, but in reality, what is there to this to the average student who is caring more about going to a Carolina basketball game? Most students know that cheating is an Honor Code violation. However, some students violate the honor code unknowingly, finding themselves before a jury of their peers. If they get caught doing something, it's kind of like they didn't really know what they were doing was a problem, or as much of a problem as it turns out to be. Student yes. advisory it's committee honor. member Lauren Allen agrees. Students need to be better informed. I think the system works really well. I think there are a lot of misconceptions spreading around campus about what's actually going on, and I think that those are really hurting the system because students don't really understand how it works. Over the past year, the honor court system has been under fire from the press because of possible mishandling of some cases. Students now have mixed feelings. Some believe in the honor code. There could be circumstances where people will cheat anyway, but for the most part, it does keep people in line. Others are confused, and many think that students don't fear the honor code at all. You signed the piece of paper saying you didn't cheat really does nothing, I guess, unless you're brought up on charges and then you could say, well, they could use it against you, but it doesn't, I don't think it really compels anyone not to. Steps are being taken to clarify UNC's 36-page judicial process manual. One thing is clear, it must happen soon. In Chapel Hill, I'm Bryce Framark, Carolina Week. Ideas and concerns raised in Monday's discussion will be further addressed. The next forum is scheduled for February and will be open to all students. Colder weather makes students more eager to get inside their favorite local bars, but getting in isn't as easy as before. Handing your ID to a bouncer no longer means a straight shot through the door. You may be asked for a second form of ID. Alcohol law enforcement recently set up shop on Franklin Street, encouraging bar owners to keep underage drinkers out. Bouncers in Chapel Hill confiscate as many as 60 or 70 fake IDs every week. Local bar ma manager Efren Sains says a fake ID has to be really good to fool a trained bouncer. Uh, yeah. We see some pretty bad ones. So sometimes they're pretty easy to pick out. Some other ones are pretty uh, hard. Now, nowadays you can get IDs on the internet. And, uh, all they do is have different holograms, and our bouncers can pick those out pretty well. Being able to get into clubs to hang out with friends is important to lots of Carolina Week students. In today's Speak Out segment, several of them let us know what they think about the ID crackdown on Franklin Street. Crackdown on IDs. Underage drinking is wrong, it's illegal, and I don't think people under the age of 21 are necessarily responsible enough to uh, drink responsibly. It's a college campus, and if people are going to drink, they're going to find some way to drink. Well, we kind of think that um, the drinking age should be lowered to 18 because we feel like if you're old enough to vote you know, in an election that you should be old enough to enjoy a couple of drinks. People underage have been able to go uptown and have been really successful in their attempts to get into bars and to drink while they're underage. Um, and the ALEs finally just kind of caught on to that, and they're really just doing their job. Like if I serve someone, regardless of how they got into the bar or to the club, as the waitress, if I serve them without checking their ID again and it's a fake, then and they get in trouble, then I also get in trouble. People are going to get around it no matter what they, what they try and do. Um, and they can come up with more rules, more regulations, but people are just going to get around it. I think the crackdown uh, of underage drinking is a good thing, but uh, I think that it should be the same at all bars and that it shouldn't be uh, 
you should let some people in and some people not, depending on their status of who they are on campus. I think that you're underage, you're underage. Our sample of opinions is in no way scientific and should not be taken as a reflection of widespread opinion on campus. UNCCH and Duke University continue to work together to bring great people to the Triangle. British Ambassador to the United States Sir Christopher Meyer visited UNCCH to talk politics with students and faculty. The ambassador met informally with members of the community before giving a speech about the role of an ambassador. Meyer stressed the importance of a strong U.S. and U.K. relationship. A number of groups sponsored Meyer's visit, including UNCCH Great Decisions Program and Glatso Welcome. Chapel Hill residents know winter weather. While they're busy gearing up for the holidays, they're adding some different items to their lists as well. Carolina Week's Christy Fair explains. This past week's blustery forecast sent many Triangle residents scrambling to the store. Although this particular storm was a false alarm for Chapel Hill, residents here weren't taking any chances this time. If we come to the store now, we where we can get everything that we're going to need so we don't have to go out in the snow. But many last-minute shoppers at the University Mall's Harris Teeter found empty shelves and long lines. It's just insane. People freak out at the first time of snow here. First to go were bread, milk, orange juice, canned goods, and fire logs. And we also found batteries, manual can openers, and water disappearing off the shelves as well. Residents still remember how January's unexpected storm dumped 24 inches of snow. They want to be ready should history repeat itself. It's better, better to be prepared than not. Residents aren't the only ones stocking up in winter weather. Harris Teeter makes preparations as well. Within 12 to 24 hours, we can get anything that we, we need. Knowing this, could make winter weather not so threatening. After the sto snowstorm last year, I wanted it to snow again this year. Kids definitely put snow on their Christmas list. Parents just hope it comes in a small package. In Chapel Hill, Christy Fair, Carolina Week. With the official start of winter weeks away, people here will be ready should Santa bring a white Christmas. Everywhere you look, folks are getting into the holiday spirit. Did you know Carolina grows Christmas? For scores of people, we'll work, we'll work some December magic for you when Carolina Week continues. What services come to mind when you think of the American Red Cross? The Red Cross does blood drives, don't they? They help out with natural disasters. Giving blood. Tornadoes and hurricanes. Blood. Natural disasters. I'll bet you didn't know that the American Red Cross also provides emergency services for military families and delivers health and safety instruction in first aid, lifeguard training, and CPR. Contact your local Red Cross chapter to learn more about the services they provide. Hey, there are a lot of ways we can help our community. Spending our money in Orange County, whether it's filling up the car, or shopping at local businesses helps maintain our roads, improves our children's schools, and creates jobs. Spending your money locally helps us all in a big way. So remember, shop orange first. Many people all along the East Coast will have a North Carolina Christmas tree as part of their holiday celebration this year. The state is second only to Oregon in national Christmas tree production. Carolina Week's Christine Vancott shows us a local farmer who helps many people get into the Christmas spirit. C.D. Smith has been growing and selling his own Christmas trees for about six years off the farm behind his house in Hillsboro. Smith plants his trees as seedlings from the North Carolina Department of Forestry, then maintains them throughout the year. He says it takes about eight years to grow an average-sized Christmas tree. Those in search of the perfect tree can come and pick out their own. Trees are tagged, cut, shaken out, and bagged to make them easy to get home. And Smith says the whole process has come to be a family holiday event. Well, you, you have, you have uh, families that come out, man and wife, and sometimes two, three, four children, and they all enjoy. And, and even teenagers come with their parents a lot of times and help pick out the trees. And, and this is something that, uh, like I say, I enjoy seeing them enjoy themselves. 
it, it just, it's just a, a nice family outing here for them to come. Smith's customers say there are many reasons why they chose to cut their own tree this year. Because they tend to stay fresher longer. They last through Christmas without dropping their needles. Um, and I just like the idea of you know, getting a fresh cut tree. I always did that as a kid um, with my dad. Now, in addition to just being more fun, Smith says that a freshly cut tree is also safer because it's more fire resistant and it smells terrific. Smith says that Christmas has always had special meaning for him, but not because of the trees. My joy comes in seeing children come out and pick out a tree and see what we do for it and, and to see their faces light up. Their faces light up more so than the Christmas tree a lot of times would who have to get it in the home. If you're still tree searching, it's not too late. Smith opens up his farm at Thanksgiving and stays open until the day before Christmas. In Hillsboro, I'm Christine Van Cott, Carolina Week. Smith says the chilly weather has been bringing out the holiday spirit in his customers. He says he's been keeping very busy these past few weeks, trying to top the nearly 200 trees he grew and sold last year. Gingerbread houses, teddy bears, and trains bring thoughts from Christmas past to mind. But the Chapel Hill Historical Society is making them all a part of Christmas present. In 1998, the Society began asking local pastry chefs to create some gingerbread replicas of some favorite Chapel Hill sites. The Chapel of the Cross was the first building made out of gingerbread, and new ones have been added every year. The Society also has a teddy bear display and a toy train complete with Santa Claus. Kids of all ages can stop by the Historical Society through December 10th from 1 to 5 to enjoy the holiday display. Those gingerbread houses, fruit cakes, and cups of eggnog are not calorie free and can quickly add up to extra holiday pounds. And as people fill out, the health spas fill up. The Student Recreation Center sees a large increase in traffic during the months of November and December. It averages between 1,600 and 2,000 people every day. This increase can be linked to the fact that the average person will gain between five and seven pounds during Thanksgiving and Christmas. Many people are trying to get a jump start on working off those extra pounds. The Recreation Center offers free weights, exercise machines, and cardiovascular equipment for everyone who wants to work out this holiday season. Eating too many holiday treats already? Some Chapel Hill residents work for change while working off holiday goodies. AIDS kills loved ones. My um, friend's uncle died of AIDS. It breaks down societies. When he first contracted the illness, he didn't even stay in this country because of all the stereotypes. Because we're from a really small town. And in Friday's World AIDS Day walk, AIDS brought people together. And then grab a ribbon and stickers, and there's walkouts up here. Friday, December 1st, was World AIDS Day, as declared by the American Association for World Health 11 years ago. In Chapel Hill, the highlight of the day was a one and a half mile walk through campus. Here, have a shake. Oh. This year's World AIDS Day message was particularly aimed at one specific section of society. And our theme this year was all men make a difference. It's time that men came together from the different sides of society and were able to address issues as men instead of as gay men and as straight men. According to speaker Jesse Moore, it's hard for men to talk about AIDS for several reasons. Straight men essentially may be afraid of identifying themselves with the, vi with the virus, with uh, action to discuss the virus, because they feel that that will make them seem gay in some way. But men and women alike participated in the walk, and each for his or her own reasons. My mother had a friend who died from AIDS, and I just think that AIDS awareness is a big issue. I think my friends are at risk, I'm at risk. It's a such huge proportion that it's hard for me to think not to be involved in the struggle with AIDS. The student that I lived with um, on the health sciences floor uh, got the word out and said there was an AIDS walk, so I'm here to uh, support uh, National AIDS Day. So together they walked, rode bikes, and carried banners, showing their unification against a disease that divides so many. More than 200 people participated in the one and a half mile walk around campus. While the snow may have missed us this weekend, the cold temperatures surely did not. Carolina Week forecaster Kelly Mahoney is up next to let us know how long they'll be around. It's great that the 
Salvation Army does so much for the needy during the holiday season. But you know, that isn't all the Salvation Army does. They also run boys and girls clubs. They also provide relief for those who need it after natural disasters. And, and they help the homeless by providing temporary relief and shelter. They even run summer camp for low-income children. Yeah. Need has no season. Please help the Salvation Army help others. That snow just skipped right over us. It really did. It was a big disappointment, wasn't it? I know. Yeah. I'm so upset about that. <laughs> it really was sad. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't because of the lack of cold temperatures, though, that's for sure. It was more of a lack of moisture. Just, just stayed to our east. It was sad. Aww. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but about those temperatures and snowfall, my weather question today has to do with how warm temperatures can be and still be able to see some snowfall. So what do you think? Is it right at that freezing point at 32 degrees? Can you get up to 36, 41.5, or 50 degrees to still have a possibility for some snow? We'll let you think about that and get back in just a little bit. But around the middle of this week, taking a look outside around campus, you can see some gray looking skies, definitely some cold temperatures. As students bundle up to walk to and from classes, it's certainly not a pleasant walk going from building to building. Are these temperatures going to stick around though? We'll check that out in just a second. But first we're going to talk about what makes it feel so cold outside when the temperatures might not be that bad. The wind chill is the factor that really comes into play here. The wind chill is something that measures heat loss from bare human skin. It's a combination of wind speed and low temperatures. And it's pretty amazing that a temperature of just 30 degrees um, combined with a wind of just 10 miles per hour can quickly make it feel like 16 degrees. So that's what's making you feel so miserable as you go from class to class. And hopefully we won't see a big wind chill impact this weekend as we're going to be heading into a milder pattern. Let's take a look at what the surface map shows us. And you can see there's a trough moving off the coast. Um, usually this will give us a chance for some precipitation, but as you can tell from all the shocking you might be getting from touching different surfaces, we're in extremely dry air right now, so we don't even have a slight chance for some precipitation well past my, uh, this weekend and into the beginning of next week. When Monday we might see the remainder of this front pushing out of the north give us a chance for some rain. Um, but that's about it. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday looking great. Some more mild temperatures move in, as I said before, 50s. And on Sunday and Monday, you might actually see us creep into the 60s with lows seasonable in the mid to upper 20s and getting into 30s and even 40s on Monday as the rain keeps the temperatures up a little bit. If you're heading out of town this weekend to the beach, um, temperature's pretty nice there, 50s, and a low of just 41 on Sunday. So that is, that'll be a great bet for this weekend. And if you're going up to the mountains, maybe to get some skiing done, 49 on Saturday, 51 on Sunday, pretty nice. Um, just above freezing for your lows. And if you are going up to the slopes, like I mentioned before, you're in luck. Four major uh, resorts are open in North Carolina. Appalachian, Cataloochee, Ski Beach, and Sugar Mountain are all up and running for some skiing. Well, that's very exciting. Yeah. So I said in the mountains, temperatures will be in the 50s. So what do you think that means for snow? Getting back to the weather question. No well, snow. No snow? Probably not, but it is possible. If you thought the answer might be D, you're right. It's more about the saturation level of the air that really matters. So in rare cases, you can actually see snow at in temperatures in excess of 50 degrees. Mm. I never would have guessed <laughs> that. No. Yeah, wow. Absolutely well, not. thanks, Kelly. You're welcome. Both Carolina basketball teams sprung into action this past week against some of the nation's best teams. And the women's soccer team looks to continue the dynasty and bring home another national championship. Devin Biggins is up next with Carolina Week Sports. What could you do with the free hour of your day? Take a jog, wash your car, bake a cake, or watch TV. Ever thought about giving blood? It all it takes an hour. It saved my life. Someday it may save yours. A single pint of blood can save three lives. Be a hero. Give blood. The second floor of Davis is where students go to pseudo-study. No real studying occurs here. Girls sit in the cushy chairs to scope out guys as they come up the stairs. 
I've never witnessed the exam break streaking that occurs there, but I'd like to see it before I graduate. No one knows the real Carolina like a student. Carolina Week, the student news show. Well, Devin, the dynasty continues for women's soccer, huh? They won again. It seems to be a tradition here in Chapel Hill and a dynasty. All right. Carolina's women's soccer team is once again number one in the land. On Sunday, the Lady Tar Heels captured their 16th national title in 19 years. First, the number five Heels had to defeat top-seeded Notre Dame Friday. Irish up 1-0. Kim Patrick heads it into the top of the goal, tying the game here. And then with seven and a half minutes left, freshman Jordan Walker kicks a bomb from the top of the box to win 1-0. I mean, so the final score of this one is 2-1, one, one down and one to go. No score through the first in the championship game. First seeded UCLA breaks the tie with this unassisted goal. Here it is, UCLA punching it in. Then, off an Alyssa Ramsey assist, Meredith Florence finds the back of the net, her 26th goal of the season. This tied it up at 1-1. Then off a redirected deflection off the UCLA defense gives the Lady Tar Heels a goal. Here's the kick, kick coming up to set up the deflection. Here it is, kicks it into the box, kicks off a UCLA defender and goes in. The Tar Heels win the 2000 national title. So to recap, it's the 16th national title in 19 years, the lowest seeded team in NCAA history to win a title, and the first time in NCAA championship history that a game has been decided by an own goal. The Heels just keep making history. The men's soccer team had a golden opportunity to play in Charlotte in the NCAA Final Four. The Heels just needed to get past the two-time defending national champion, Indiana Hoosiers. Here we go to Fetzer Field. Both teams coming out focused and having opportunities early, but Indiana will break the shutout in the 59th minute with this Ryan Matt goal off of a UNC defensive mistake. The Tar Heels turn up the heat late in the second half, out shooting the Hoosiers 18-8 for the game, but the Heels just couldn't find the back of the net. And so one of the best men's team ever at UNC has its season and championship hopes come to an end, and all by just one goal. Oh yeah, absolutely. I was convinced that we would score. I was convinced that we would pull this game out. And uh, the chances we did create, there were legitimate chances right in front of the goal. I mean, they're just the keeper threw himself in, their players threw themselves into the balls that were ready to be shot. And they did a good job at that. At the beginning of the season, the Tar Heel basketball team was thought to be one of the top teams in the land. And this week, this past week, Tate uh, tested just how good those Tar Heels are. It's been a roller coaster week for the Tar Heels. The lows of the week include losses to Michigan State and Kentucky, and seeing the team's national ranking drop from 6th to 14th in the most recent AP poll. The high of the week was Monday night's impressive victory against the University of Miami. Brendan Haywood had 18 points, 14 rebounds, and 10 blocks to record the first triple double in Carolina history. This was the first real tough stretch for the Coach D led Heels. It gives me a lot of confidence. I was a basket case the last two days. I mean, uh, the, after the Kentucky game, I was really depressed. And, uh, um, you know, you don't know how we're going to react. We lost two games in a row. Second worst loss in uh, uh, Smith Center history. You know, we better come out smoking. The week started out with a 77-64 to defeat at the hands of the defending national champion Spartans. Just two days later, the Heels were back home and got embarrassed by the Kentucky Wildcats 93-76. to It was the second worst loss in the history of the Dean Dome. The Heels and their faithful were going through a rough streak. But Monday night, the Heels let out some of their frustrations and stormed the Hurricanes. Ronald Curry played 18 minutes at the point guard and offered some stability at a position that's been giving the Heels some trouble so far this young season. Max Owen says the real Tar Heels were the ones playing the Canes. Um, this win just set a tone for like the rest of the season. Coach said he can take a loss if we just go out and just play our hearts out. I mean, you can't say every shot going fall. A young team and a young coach will probably get a little more of a honeymoon period, but the program's past success is something all Tar Heel fans expect any Carolina team to live up to. Sylvia's husband said the tumor is benign. And According to Sylvia's husband, the doctor Same had tears in, in his eyes that the fourth the ranked Irish would spoil that plan with a 78 to 55 trouncing of the heels. The contest was part of the Elite Four Holiday Classic at Disney World. Laquanda Barksdale had 14 points to go along with her 17 rebounds in a losing effort. Next up for the heels, the Maryland Terrapins come calling on Saturday to kick off the ACC season.
Well, also on that Kentucky game, Vince Carter had his jersey honored at the rafters of the Dean Smith Center. Oh, how nice. So does that mean his number? It's not retired, but it's only honored. Antoine was retired last year. Vince, is, he'll hang for the rest of the time, but it's just been honored. So, they, so people could use his number. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, right. Devin. Thanks, Dev. It was the kind of library noise that's A-OK. -okay. Noise from song and more from a North Carolina native with a knack for the word and more. Carolina Week continues after this. Mother taught me. She's Averaging 18%. Balance the budget. Increasing clouds for... One out of 20 people in the United States has been infected with hepatitis C. Two billion people in the world have had hepatitis C in their lifetime. 80% of newborns that are infected with hepatitis B are likely to have it for life. More people are infected with hepatitis B than HIV. Many people have it and don't know it. There is no cure yet, but it is preventable, and there is support and treatment. For more information, visit our webpage or email us at info at hepb.org. North Carolina native and acclaimed storyteller Jackie Torrance delights crowds wherever she goes. This weekend it was a crowd in the usually very quiet Wilson Library. And because she's so good at what she does, we'll let her tell the story. At four years old, you know, you don't know too many tunes. <laughs> and you don't have too many words to your songs. So the words that I knew to what songs I knew, I sung them all at one time. <laughs> Jesus loves me, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And the cow jumped over the moon. It's good to see an audience of children again. I missed telling stories. When I got sick about seven years ago, it, it just frightened me because I thought this is it. This is the end of it. But so many people wrote to me and told me how much inspiration they had gotten from my stories. People said that they had been sick for a long time and they laughed from hearing my stories. Or, or somebody was moved to tears with hearing my stories. Or I frightened their children. And that's really what gave me a lot of confidence that I can't quit. I may have to retire, <laughs> but that's all right. I did tell a good story every now and then. <laughs> Torrance tells stories to her five-year-old grandson's class, and with her daughter expecting twins, she says she's going to hang around long enough to tell them some stories, too. Well, that about does it for this edition of Carolina Week. Thank you for joining us, and be sure to come back next week. Until then, have a good night and a good week. Good night.